and good morning and welcome to another episode of Money Matters only here on OneDealAway.com. My name is Nev, your host, and I am beyond excited to share with you today's news when it comes to money, markets, and investing. So let's get to it. What are we going to talk about today? Well, it is Thursday and somewhere in my head, I decided that Thursdays are excellent day for us to talk about real estate markets and what's going on in that particular sector. So today we're going to be covering what's going on with real estate. Are we buying? Are we selling? Are we holding? Or what are we doing? Let's find out what's going on with mortgage rates, what's going on with sales, what's going on with prices, the beliefs or the motivation of people and how they're moving and behaving. So that is exactly what we're going to cover today. And I'm excited to share with you what I was able to uncover so that we can learn together. Let's do this. All right, y'all. So we have some excellent stuff to go over when it comes to real estate. And really the biggest piece about real estate to remember is a few things. It's local. It is slow moving, meaning when we get data, it's a bit behind. It's lagging. So it's not like a stock market where it's up to date or a crypto market where it's up to date. Um, and of course, it's going to be uh, dependent on people, on humans and what they're doing, whether they are jumping in, buying, not buying, uh, where they're buying, where they're going. So those are all of the things that we have to keep in mind. And the first thing that I want to talk about is mortgage, because mortgage rates and what's going on in the lending world has a great impact of what we can expect to be happening when it comes to the real estate world, because those are very much connected. The vast majority of people, uh, whether they are homeowners, right, or they're investors, whether small or large, uh, most of us depend on lending. So let's take a look at some of the articles and reports that I was able to find. So UWM, about a month ago or so, maybe a little bit more at this point, we have talked about UWM, United Wholesale Mortgage, that it was offering uh, loan programs that was at 2.5% interest rate. Now we have received the reports that they're offering a VA loan program with the mortgage rates as low as 2.25%. Now I've been talking about this component that it is going to shift a great deal and that we're going to expect that these uh, fixed rate mortgages are going to be coming down. And they have been, uh, but of course, as I have mentioned before, this is a very slow moving market. So it doesn't happen overnight. You got to kind of work through it over the course of time in order to benefit from it. So one of the interesting pieces to keep in mind is that last month, so see, I was right. Last month, UWM rolled out a new loan program that offered borrowers an interest rate as low as 2.5% for both purchase mortgages and refinance. Now, as of June 18th, we reported that the average rate for 30-year fixed mortgage was 3.13, down from 3.21 the week prior. So one of the things to keep in mind is that it is sort of on the low end and it has a potential to go even lower. Now, of course, that is my personal sort of take on the whole thing, not a financial advice per se, not necessarily something that I can guarantee is going to happen. Nobody can do that. And you know what, y'all, if I could guarantee and promise many things of how things are going to work out in the market uh, around the pandemic and everything else, I think I would have a very different job and probably very different title. But I do come pretty darn close in predicting some of these things. So Mortgage Bankers Association. So uh, this is a national mortgage news is place where you can actually find a vast majority of what's going on within the mortgage industry, within the mortgage world. And you can see that the uh, commercial real estate lending uh, is uh, sort of uh, shifting a little bit. Right. So here is where we were in December in uh, 19 and December on 09. Um, again, 
you're going to get lagging data, y'all. I don't, I can't help you. I, I, I got nothing. So, but it's showing over here the, the asset share by size. Uh, the one of the interesting pieces that came out very recently is the purchase and refine applications are decreasing. We talked about that in the last couple of the episodes that, you know, this is kind of what the, what it looks like. And you can see from this chart right here that vast majority of the uh, borrowing that is happening is happening on the refi side, not necessarily on the purchase side. That is an interesting thing to keep in mind. Because oftentimes in a healthier of the markets, you know, we see or, or the booming markets, should I say, we see that the purchase is actually larger. But that is not the case right now where we are. I think people are refinancing to grab a hold of the lower rates to uh, secure and lock in the lower rates and to be able to benefit from what's going on right now. Uh, purchase is uh, we're going to talk about some of the purchase stuff in a moment, but as you can see, is not as hot as it typically would be uh, in any previous uh, component. Now, the uh, this is the political party. I don't know why they're doing that, but this is the piece that I actually thought it was very interesting for us to take a look at, and that is the forbearance for uh, curve is dropping. And if I click on this, let me see what happens because I haven't done that. Oh, we go into, there we go. We go into the article. So this is going to be an interesting piece for you to take a note and for us, all of us to take a note, for me to take a note as well. Uh, we can see that sort of the total, the uh, non-depositories and depository institutions. And you can see that the curve is sort of slowing down, right? It's sort of peaking. And the interesting piece to note is, oh no, I, I moved my mouse and something happened. Um, interesting piece to note right here is that we are seeing this curve pattern with many different things, right? With the Fed balance sheet that we talked about yesterday, with the stock market that we have been monitoring and watching. Um, and so we're seeing this with unemployment. So we're seeing this everywhere. And we're not now at this, I would call it a precipice of what's going on with the, with the changes in the behavior in where the money is going, how the money is being used or not used, is it being spent or not spent, and what the needs are. And of course, it is very normal that as we're starting to slowly try to climb out of this crisis, which we're not climbing out of it, we're attempting to, uh, but think of this crisis as a Mount Everest, and we're at the very base, and we might have reached uh, sort of the, the, the first, you know, hundred yards up or maybe first mile. I don't know. Um, so we still have a long ways to go before you start thinking that it's all done and over with. It very much is not. We're still, uh, relatively speaking, early on. I would still say that we are, you know, if top of Mount Everest was uh, phase five, I would say we're maybe at phase two. So we are moving, uh, but we're not quite there yet. So you can see kind of what's going on. I'm going to let you take a look at this while I take some hydration. Very important for everybody. Okay. So you can see that the uh, dark blue is April. And then as we switch over to this almost like a navy slash black, uh, that's the June 8th through 14th. So again, a little bit of a lag in data, but much better than, you know, looking at only a year ago. Now, one of the interesting pieces that I also wanted to share with you is what's going on in the commercial real estate. So for that, we're going to jump to this particular article where we're talking about New York City commercial real estate. Now, of course, I want to point out one thing again, real estate is localized and you cannot expect that what you see here in New York City to apply to a city where you are. However, a lot of things are probably rhyming and so do pay attention and look for news just like this. So <clears throat> here's kind of what's going on in the commercial real estate in New York City. And I'm using New York City as sort of the 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 
economic leader when it comes to United States uh, because a lot of business. It's one of the largest cities. And of course, it makes sense to kind of take a look at it. Everybody knows where New York City is. Nobody knows where Providence, where I live, is. And that's okay. It's perfectly fine with me. I chose it for a reason. Well, multiple reasons, but... uh, so now we can estimate that 16 trillion U.S. commercial real estate has uh, only begun to show as buildings start reopening in major cities and properties emerge from months and mass shutdown. And they're now in phase two of reopening, meaning restaurants, bars can begin offering outdoor seating only. Some in-store retail can resume. Uh, salons are opening, barbershops, car dealers, and that kind of stuff. So that's sort of the exciting piece that you can actually go out And, uh, you know, something is actually going to be open other than just a grocery store and a pharmacy. But an interesting piece that they're talking about over here is this particular piece that is very interesting. And here is the quote. I think it's going to be a hailstorm out there. This is Jeffrey Citron, co-managing partner at law firm David of Hutcher and Citron LLP. And I think in most instances, it's probably the best interest of landlords to sit down and work with their tenants. Now, they're representing Victoria's Secret stores as part of the L Brands uh, that earlier this month filed a nearly $1 million monthly claim for rent relief against the landlord um, in its Herald Square store in Manhattan. The tenant was arguing in a court filing uh, that thinks that its lease uh, property should be rescinded partially due to unprecedented pause that descended over New York City as officials battle the global health crisis, but also because the experience of shopping for consumer products in retail stores has been altered forever. So you are seeing, we are seeing this a whole lot more where you have these large uh, companies that have a lot of retail space are basically going and say, and uh, they haven't been paying uh, rent, and they're arguing now, going to the court and saying, you just have to forgive my lease because this is ridiculous. This is unprecedented. We can't pay this stuff. Um, you just got to sort of rescind it and sort of, you know, no harm, no foul. Everybody walks away. But the problem lies on the other side, right? Well, we could make an argument for the, in this case, Victoria's Secret, for example, or any other retailer that, yeah, sure, we understand that. There's also a problem on the other side of the equation because it's not one-sided equation. It is two-sided just like any equation. And that is that if you do that, well, what happens with the property owner? And we could say, well, you know, property owner that doesn't need it. Um, I would argue they do because here's kind of how it works. Vast majority of these large properties, while being held by these large landlords, are being financed by people just like you and I. They are filled with investors who have put in their hard money, potentially some retirement funds, uh, pension funds, and that kind of stuff that is also part of it as well. And so if the landlord doesn't get paid, the investors don't get paid, which means you and I end up not getting paid. The bank that also lent money towards this project doesn't get paid. And so that's where another part of the problem lies, right? So it's not that simple because, you know, if the if the retailer doesn't pay, then the landlord can pay. If the landlord can't pay, then the bank doesn't get paid. If the bank doesn't get paid, well, they might have to go bankrupt and have to be bailed out by the central bank, which is problematic all on its own. Now, on the other side, also the investors, people like you and I, don't get paid or our pension funds don't get paid. So when we go into the retirement and need that money, that money is not there. As you can see, it's not a very easy or simple problem to resolve as much as people uh, on Robinhood app think that it might be trading and expecting the V-shaped recovery, which again, I have been stating since March, that is not going to happen. Again, I could be wrong, but I have a hard time seeing anything but that. So, because economy and markets at some point are going to have to connect. As you know, it's highly disjointed right now. Economy is right over here and sort of one book, one page. Markets are up here on one book, one page, and they're not even connected. They're not even the same library, y'all. And at some point, 
those are going to have to connect. And it's either going to be economy has to shift on up to match the markets or markets have to drop to meet the economy. And I expect that it's going to be some sort of combination of both where economy, I don't expect it to jump that high that fast. And uh, there's a much higher probability that the markets will drop down that fast and that much. So that's kind of where we are. Now we're going to switch a little bit into what's going on when it comes to uh, residential real estate, right? Like, so people who are going into condos, who are going into apartments, uh, single family homes, what is happening in that world? Where are we now? What's going on? And so we have a few different articles. You might see some conflicting information. And again, that makes perfect sense because depending on what market you look at, because real estate market is not this globalized market like a stock market, it's localized. I keep repeating that because I think people struggle with understanding when we talk about these things. All of it is meant to just raise the awareness, give you a broad picture. And then when you go out there looking for your home or for your investment, then you can start paying attention to some of these um, markers, so to speak, indicators to give you an idea of what you should be looking at for your specific market. Okay, fair? Cool. Let's do this. All right. So U.S. new home sales plunge to 10-year low as exodus from cities accelerate. This is an interesting piece. I'm going to give you this particular chart where you can actually see this. We're not going to read the whole thing because we have a whole lot more articles to cover today, but we're going to take a look at some of these charts. As you will see that the green is this existing home sales month over month, and the blue is existing home sales year over year. So take a look at what's going on, and then let's talk. Now, the interesting piece that you will notice when you take a look at this chart is that you see the green lines, but you also see the red. Red is basically a negative version of the green. Uh, they just didn't say it. So you will see that everything is turning down, and you will kind of see that we are at the levels since uh, right before the 2008 uh, crisis. So this is kind of where we are right now when it comes to the, the home sales, meaning people are not necessarily buying. And I think that that's an important aspect to keep in mind. And uh, when it comes to the whole like city exodus, we've already talked about that in the show. We've actually talked about it earlier this week, I want to say maybe Monday or Tuesday, uh, where I briefly did talk about the real estate is people, 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 right? You got to buy where people want to go live and you got to buy where people are moving to. And in the past, people were moving somewhere because of work. Nowadays, that's not so much the case because guess what? They can work from home, meaning they don't have to be locked into a particular location. So I've done a few videos on that. And if you haven't seen that, all of those videos are on YouTube channel. YouTube channel is Money Matters, where if you're not watching live on OneDealAway.com, you are likely watching a replay on YouTube. By the way, if you are watching on YouTube, do me a huge favor click a like button, click, give me thumbs up, do subscribe and hit the bell button. So every time a new report comes out, you get notified easily. We do the show every single morning at 7 a.m. So you can expect to receive a daily update on what's going on with the money, with the markets. Okay. So regional sales by price, you can see existing uh, single family homes as of May. And let me see if I can make this somewhat bigger so we can take a look at it. And uh, you can see kind of what's going on. So take a look. You have a region right here. Uh, you have sort of the uh, zero to 100K, what's going on. You can see everything is down. Everything is down. There's not a single thing that is up. And, uh, uh, you know, U.S. is down at the bottom. And you can see that we are experiencing some major shifts in the Northeast region, which makes sense because Northeast region does have some major cities that are highly cyclical, highly expensive. And then West um, is also going to be another market where we're seeing this stuff. And of course, when it comes to West, 1 million plus homes, look at the decline, y'all. 
56%. And again, it makes sense because when we look at West Coast, think California, very, very expensive and lots of $1 million plus homes. Think of Seattle, right? Washington, very expensive. Portland, Oregon, equally as expensive. So that entire Western board is very, very, very expensive. So it makes perfect sense while we're seeing the major crashes right over there. And then, of course, South, you see this one million plus is also the second leader when it comes to the drops and what we're seeing. And again, to me, that makes sense because when I think of South, I think of those beautiful mansions in, you know, Georgia, Atlanta is pretty expensive. Uh, Florida, it has sort of the, the, the pricey and not so pricey, but there are some areas that are very nice, very developed, very expensive, luxurious areas. And I do expect that that is going to shift. Sale distribution, you can take a look right over here of what's going on. And you can see that the vast amount of sales that are happening are between $100,000 and $500,000 across all markets. The percent change in inventory by price from one year ago, again, you can see that it's all down, all negative. And, uh, you know, we are seeing, again, West leading when it comes to $1 million plus, and, uh, uh, you know, as, as well as the 750000 to $1 million. And then you can see that uh, the New England um, will take, or Northeast, I don't know why I said New England, Northeast will take a larger share as at zero to 100000 as well as 100000 to 250000 uh, combined with the West Coast. So you can see kind of where the distribution is. Uh, and as far as the change in inventory. So a lot of inventory missing in action when it comes to these particular prices and what's going on. Now, the final piece that I want to share with you is the uh, the chart from Bloomberg, which is a maze decline in uh, pushing the existing home price. So you can see what's going on. And they actually highlighted right over here. This is the green one is the new one family house sold um, annual total uh, seasonally adjusted. So you can see that we were going down and there's a slight uptick on up, but not by much. Uh, you can see the existing home sales are down, pending home sales are down. Um, and, you know, we are well below, well at or below at 2010 level. So that's kind of where we are right now. And again, it's talking about the regional breakdowns and so on. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that's one of the articles that I wanted to share with you when it comes to uh, real estate. Now, one of the other piece to also remind you of and share with you is that nearly half of Americans consider selling home as COVID crushes finances. So the number of people that they are basically saying that they are you know, there are people that are worried about making payments. And you can see right over here that, that there is over half of the respondents that uh, have said that they are worried about making future mortgage payments. And 47% consider selling their home because of the inability to service mortgage payments. One of the things to also keep in mind is that 81% of respondents have experienced unexpected financial stress due to the virus-induced recession, and 56% uh, reduced spending so they could service mortgage payments. This is incredibly important and huge. We just talked about what's going on with the... Uh, uh, we talked about what's going on when it comes to the forbearance, for example, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we have millions of homes in forbearance, and, uh, you know, we are having people, whether they're in forbearance or not, still being worried about their mortgage payments. And so some of them might look to refinance if they can lower the monthly payments substantially. Uh, but what we're seeing, what I am seeing, is that vast majority of folks uh, of the lenders that want to sort of refinance would prefer that you actually borrow more uh, so that you sort of mortgage on up. Uh, that while the 
monthly payments, uh, you know, the, the rate might go down. The monthly payment might not necessarily. And so uh, I believe that we're seeing a bit of a discrepancy in what the borrowers want versus what the lenders want. Um, ultimately, one will win. Um, I just don't know necessarily who. I think consumers will win at some point in the future. I just don't know if that future is right now or if it's going to be a bit later. Now, another article that kind of goes along with this piece that is very important to pay attention to is mortgage delinquencies surge to nine-year high. So borrowers more than 30 days late surge to 4.3 million in May, up almost a quarter of a million from previous month. This means at least 8% of U.S. mortgages were either past due or in foreclosure. Now, this report said that uh, uh, those who qualify for forbearance made payments early in the pandemic. However, now the percentage is much lower, which is the part that I was fearing. Some 15% of homeowners in forbearance agreements made payments as of June 15, which is down from 28% in May and 46 in April. This is important aspect to understand and uh, you know, read and know about because what we are seeing is that while people were jumping into forbearance, sort of preparing for what we're seeing, they were trying their best to pay. And as you saw, that half of them uh, that were in forbearance in April made payments. Then we dropped down to a third. Now we're down to 15 percent. And this is hugely problematic. Another piece to keep in mind that I keep reminding everybody here, uh, my students, the audience, uh, whether on YouTube, here live on OneDealAway.com, or uh, folks in the Facebook channels or LinkedIn or everywhere else, and um, right down below, actually, right over here uh, is the scroller. So if you want to connect with me on social, that's where you go. That's where you can do that piece. Um, but I keep reminding folks that, Fall is when we're going to see a big uptake in what's uh, the resolution, so to speak, in the forbearance, whether they're going to have to foreclose or whether they will be allowed to refinance. So we won't know that until September, October of this of this year. Um, so that's the first group. The second one is going to be in March, April and May of 2021. So we still have a long ways to go. And of course, if you stay tuned with OneDealAway.com and Money Matters Show that we do, we will be keeping you updated as we go through this entire thing. Now, the article continues to share one of the very interesting pieces, and that is that the highest rate of delinquencies in May were in Louisiana, New York, New Jersey, and Florida. National Association of Realtors survey stated that nearly half of responders considering selling their home because of an ability to service mortgage payments. So that's incredibly important. And that is the piece that I have been talking about. And so this is yet another reason why I'm saying there is no V-shape recovery at all. One piece that I want to talk about is what's going on, the difference between the existing homes and the new homes. So let's talk a little bit about what is the difference between the two before we jump into analysis and into articles to learn more what's going on within a few different markets when it comes to, obviously, real estate. So the existing homes are the homes that have been built at some point before. They are owned by a party right now, whether that's an individual or a company or a corporation, it doesn't matter, and they are looking to sell. That's an existing home that is being put up for sale. The brand new home in this particular conversation is going to be a home that is recently built. Nobody lived in it before. And what we're seeing, the reports are basically saying, is that the new homes, there's a whole lot more interest in those than existing. And the reason for that is that because people don't want to navigate the whole coronavirus, who lived where, what do I have to clean, you know, how do I navigate open houses and all of those components. They can go into the new home. Nobody's been living there. It's much easier, much simpler to see and show. So that's kind of what, we, what we're going to see. We're going to explore a bit more. But before we go there, I do want to share one more article because we just talked about what's going on 
uh, when it comes to the uh, very expensive, luxurious market and what's going on in that world. And so I want to share with you an article that I was able to find. So we have a uh, founder of Under Armour, Kevin Plank, who sold his Georgetown, Washington, D.C. mansion for $17.25 million, which is a discount from the initial asking price. The initial masking price was $29.5 million, um, and it was listed for sale in 2018. Now, unable to sell, he lowered the list price to $24.5 million, which is $5 million reduction, all right? And uh, then it, uh, uh, he bought it at 7.85 in 2013. So don't cry for Kevin. Kevin is doing just fine. Don't worry about Kevin. Uh, but he is basically had that the new mysterious cash buyer paid cash, which is really funny. A mysterious buyer paid cash through his or her identity remains cloaked behind something called the priority holdings trust. <laughs> So it's basically an uh, individual who doesn't want people to know, and that is perfectly fine. This is an interesting piece that I also wanted to share with you that I think it's very, very important that you could work with a CPA or an attorney to create a privacy trust to basically prevent everybody in the world to know what you have purchased. So you have an ability to do that should you ever want to do that. And you can actually do that even if you own a home right now. So the buyer bought the home at an all cash transaction for 17.25 million or at a 41% discount to the original list price. Now, this is really, really interesting piece because they're actually saying that he is not the only wealthy person unloading real estate at the recession crashes, crashes household and decimates businesses. Elon Musk recently sold one of his mansions and has listed five others. Uh, Kylie Jenner just sold her Beverly Hills home for 17 million cash deal. Khloe Kardashian listed her mansion not too long ago. So you can see that there are many, many wealthy individuals who are selling and they're basically saying, hey, it's time to sell. If you want to sell, it's time to sell right now. And I absolutely agree. So if you have real estate that you are holding on to, that you are not quite sure whether you want to hold on to for a very, very, very long time, I am talking at least five to 10 years, if not longer, now is the time to sell. Now, if you have income producing real estate, uh, you might not necessarily need to worry about that, but do make sure that the future potential rents or the lack thereof can sustain and that you are set up pretty okay when it comes to this whole piece. If you are looking to sell, I believe that now is the best time, absolute best time to sell if you're looking to do that right now. So sales of new homes rose off multi-year low as sales of existing houses and especially condos plunged. What gives? So in the pandemic change where Americans wanted to live, it will be one of the most far-reaching developments. And uh, the, so what they're basically talking about here is the part that I have been talking about. I think I started to talk about it in March, maybe April, uh, on different channels to say, we're going to see mass exodus from the cities. People are going to go into suburbs, into more rural areas, into larger areas, not necessarily like a larger getting a mansion, although some might. Um, I'm talking more of going from a con condo or an apartment into a single family home where they can have their own backyard, where they're a bit more removed from the city because they can. And if they get locked down, at least they have their own backyard where they can go and they feel like they don't have to share elevators and, and parking garages and navigate all of those different components. And of course, it makes sense. People are doing it. So Sales of new family homes rose 12.7% in May compared to the last year. Some home buyers sought to avoid buying someone else's homes due to issue of the pandemic and the sale of existing homes plunged almost 27% in May. Now, April's new home sale prices were chopped from 623,000 reported a month ago to 580,000 reported uh, only two days ago. 
and this is the worst since April of 2016. Now, Maya sales will have to be looked again and revised from a month from now. So this is one of those things in, in real estate, as I keep saying, is that the information lags uh, and then it gets kind of adjusted. It's sort of like the unemployment numbers that we keep getting, which, by the way, that should be released today as well. And we'll see if we're still flirting between one and a half and two million of new unemployment claims or if we're dropping down. So that's going to be a key measurement and something that is very, very interesting. So you can see right here a sales of new family houses and you can kind of see what's been going on, right? Seasonally adjusted annual rate in thousands. And you can see that we kind of hit the, uh, uh, you know, uh, up and kind of going down and sort of. So it's sort of flattening, I would say, but it's definitely repeating. You can see a very repeatable cycle here. This is 17, 18. Look very similar, not necessarily the same, but very, very similar. So it is normal in the months of May and June to see the uptick in sales. Now, the massive boom in multifamily housing has replaced a significant portion of demand for single family houses. Single family houses um, sales in May 2020 were on par where they've been in the 1970s. That is very interesting. And you can kind of see what's been going on. Sale of single family houses, it dropped, it dropped really high in the, right? Like this is the, the crisis of the 2000, well, pre-crisis of 2008 and nine. Then it's been dropping. Then it sort of hit the bottom and we've been kind of climbing out of it with, of course, going up and down. And this is kind of where we are right now. So we're not at the low that we've always been. But it is interesting piece that we're sort of getting out of the condos back into single family homes. And this is sort of the natural way that things work, right? We go from one end of the spectrum to another and we keep shifting and we go urban and rural and it always keeps shifting. Uh, but the shifts are very gentle, very sudden, uh, not sudden, sorry, subtle, subtle not sudden, subtle, sudden price changes, subtle people moves. The median pri price ticked up 1.6% year over year to $317,900, below where it had been in May 2017, which was 323600 uh, So you can see that this is kind of where the median prices have been going. And uh, it's, you know, kind of up and down, but it's flirting around that $320,000 level. Now, plenty of inventory. Supply of unsold new houses declined to 318,000, seasonally adjusted, of course, everything is seasonally adjusted, a supply of 5.6 month at the current rate of sale. Typically, four month supply is uh, uh, more than plenty to satisfy the market. So, there you go. We're not necessarily oversaturated, not undersaturated. So, <clears throat> sorry about that. Something in my throat. I am still suffering from allergies here. Um, uh, anyways, uh, when I look at this stuff and say, well, we have uh, four is what we need for current sales. That's historically normal. We're at 5.6. So we have slightly more inventory than we quite need. That means that the prices are going to stay roughly same-ish, maybe slightly lower than what was the listing price, uh, but roughly same-ish. And again, that depends on whether we have more supply that jumps on or whether we have a bit more demand that comes in. Now, whether this, um, one of the things that is going to be interesting to pay attention to and monitor is that whether this whole like, mass exodus from cities into more of the rural area is a short-term pandemic-related only, or is it going to be a slightly longer-term sort of move and shift out of the condominiums, out of the apartments, and into the single-family homes that are a bit more suburban, that are in a smaller towns and cities. And I think a big part of that is going to uh, drive the, obviously, cost of living and prices. 
the pandemic, right? The virus is going to be a part, big part of it. And I do expect that the virus piece is going to be a conversation for next at least 12, maybe 24, maybe even longer months. So it's not going away anytime soon. It is here to stay for a little while longer um, until we get it resolved, whether that is a vaccine, uh, whether that is that it just sort of dies off on its own or whether we build up a herd immunity. Um, so all of those are a possibility when we talk about these particular components. Now, it is going to be very, very interesting to see how the human behavior is and whether it is here to stick. And uh, that is going to drive also change in development and in how we do uh, stuff. So if there is a change, right, if people are going more rural, then I do expect that highly cyclical, highly expensive markets like New York City, Seattle, San Francisco, uh, Boston, Atlanta, Miami, um, L.A., San Diego, right? Like, come on, y'all. You know exactly what I'm talking about. I do expect that the prices are going to just go to the floor in those areas. But we won't know that for a little while longer. So if you are salivating on the mentioning of some of these cities and some of these names, just wait. Just wait. And this is not going to be a story just for United States. I think this is going to be a story throughout the world. So we're thinking, you know, if we go to Europe, I'm thinking like London and Madrid and Paris. And so just hold on and wait if that is something you want to do. Patience is the key here. I have been talking about it for a little while longer. Um, if you are looking for more of the suburban areas, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's not necessarily the worst idea potentially to go in. But again, it just depends on what is your exit strategy. Like, why are you buying the home? Are you buying for yourself? Are you buying as investment? Like, all of those components are very, very important. And you need to understand of what are you doing when it comes to real estate? Why are you buying stuff? Now, we did talk about the sale of new homes, right? I want to very briefly talk about the home sales uh, plunging uh, of the existing homes because those are connected. Remember, we talked about it. So we talked a little bit about the uh, new. Let's talk just a little bit about the existing, and that is going to wrap up today's episode. Sale of existing homes plunged 29% in May, and you can actually see what's been going on. Look at this. We've been sort of you know down, um, and we are right around the level of, they're saying October 2010, but if you go further and just extend the line, y'all, you will see that we are in the basically early 2009, 2009. So we're right back to where the crisis was back before this crisis. So now we're going to have to define which crisis are we talking about. So that is something that is going to be very, very interesting um, to pay attention to. Existing home sales plunge. So you can see what's going on here as well that we are hitting some very, very low levels. This is change of month over month from year ago. And so every da, uh, line that you see here is basically the change of the month from previous year. So, um, right, so it's comparing like May of 2020 to May of 2019, May of 2019 to May of 2018. So it sort of looks back. And they're saying that the single sale of single family ho homes plunged 25% year over year, condos are down 41%. And the big me move to the suburbs. Again, we just talked about this stuff. We don't need to talk about it right now. And it is something to pay attention to. Now, the National Association of Realtors had put in the reports that are stating something very interesting. Relatively better performance of single-family homes in relation to multifamily condominiums properties clearly suggest migration from the city centers to suburbs. Important piece to know if you are an investor. I've been talking about it for a little while. I've been talking about that you want to go in and look at suburbs. You go in and buy something if you're an investor to be able to either resell or lend um, or rent, right? Um after witnessing several consecutive years of urban revival, the new trend looks to be in the suburbs as more companies allow greater flexibility to work from home. Again, we talked about it. We covered it. Here is where the purge has been happening. Northeast, yet again, 
leading the pack combined with West. And again, we explained why that is. South is the third, and then Midwest is sort of the center of the country that we're seeing some drops, but not as severe as Northeast, West, or South. Median price dropped from April to May, and the big increases in the median price are always from April to May. And now we're seeing in this May, median price actually fell, not gone up, which is the first April to May decline in the data going back to 1999. And you can see what's been always going on. And even in the, the giant crash of the 2008, 2009, when it came to real estate and mortgage and all of that stuff, we still saw a change up April to May. This is a first one. We're actually dropping down and it's not a giant drop, but it's a first drop. And that is a clue that gives us a clue to pay attention to stuff. Now, they're saying inventory is rising, still down 18.8% from May of last year. Sales have plunged a lot more, 27%. So unsold homes uh, for sale rose to 4.8 month supply. This is the existing homes, right? We talked about the new, now we're talking about the existing, and you can see what's been going on of the existing homes, they're going down, there's a slight increase right over here. So it's going to be important to pay attention to what's going on. Housing markets in the first moments of struggling with the economic consequences of the pandemic, housing markets move slowly. Everything takes time. Data always lags and markets are very local, each with very different dynamics. So millions of homeowners have entered forbearance. And this too is going to be a mess for people who still haven't found the job when the forbearance agreements expire. The market hasn't even begun to wade into this mess. So they are repeating the same thing that what I have stated when we started today's episode, when we started today's show. So it's important for you to know, for you to understand what's going on in the markets. And this is the reason why we do this show, why we cover this stuff, and why it's important for you to continuously keep up with what's going on, keep on learning. And the best way to do that is to join the show. It is absolutely free. It costs you nothing. Simply subscribe if you're watching in YouTube. And do me a favor. If you haven't hit the like button, please do me a favor and hit it right now. Thank you very much for watching. Until next time, stay forever money blessed. And do remember, you are only one deal away.